1 Kings chapter 18, verses 30 through 39. And the word of God today from the King James text reads as follows. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is the God. Amen. Father, we thank You, God, once again for the Word of the Lord. We thank You for the presence of the Lord that we feel as we sing the songs of the church as we're reminded of that wonderful day when we shall be looking upon you face to face, and the Word of God promises that we shall see you as you are. O oh, Master, we are not yet all that you would have us to be, but you have enabled us one day to become partakers of your holy nature. Master, today we look forward to that day with great expectation and great hope. In the meantime, O oh God, we live in a sinful world. We live amongst sinful people. Master, the Word of God tells us that as the day of the Lord approaches, evil men shall wax worse and worse. And surely today we see this happening. Master, we need a word from God today. We need to hear from heaven. There is no way that this divine transaction can take place without the anointing, the power, the presence of the Holy Ghost. Touch my feeble lips of clay. Help me to speak only that which you would have me to speak. To remain silent, Lord, in any area where you would have me to remain silent. Minister by your Spirit to the people of God today. Pour out the Holy Ghost on hungry hearts and hungry lives. Touch body, send forth your word to heal, to deliver, to save. Reclaim the backslider, save the lost. 
for we ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Praise God. Amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. You can't stop the fire. Boy, I'm going to tell you, I never dreamed in a million years that I would live to see the Christian church in the deplorable, sad condition that I see it in today. You know, so many in the church decry those of us who dare to speak up and say that there is something missing, that something is not right, that things are not being done the way that the Lord would have them to be done. There are many people in the church world who despise a preacher like myself when I dare get up and say that things are not what they ought to be. When Elijah the prophet stood before Ahab the king, Ahab said, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Aren't you the troublemaker? Aren't you the rabble-rouser? I'm here to tell you today, when people are willing to be truthful and honest, when they're willing to answer to God and God alone, when they're willing to not go along with the majority and not go along with the mainstream without fail, we are labeled the troublemakers. But we're not the troublemakers. We're the ones who are trying to help the church and trying to help believers find the fix, find the cure to our present dilemma. You can't fix anything that you're not willing to recognize is broken. For anyone who's ever gone through the process of recovery, you know that in AA, for instance, the very first step is simply acknowledging that you are an alcoholic. If you cannot acknowledge that you have a problem, then there is nobody anywhere, there is nothing anyone can do anywhere at any time to help you fix that problem. That's right. There are people... Tommy and I know people, some of us have relatives who have gone to their grave because they were sick and they went to the doctor and the doctor told them how grave and how serious their condition was, but they didn't want to believe the doctor, so they signed themselves out of the hospital against medical advice and they went home and there at the house they succumbed to their disease, to their affliction, and they wind up closing their eyes in the temporal only to open their eyes in the eternal, in eternity. Why? Because they did not want to acknowledge the problem. I'm here to tell you today, there are false prophets all through the Christian church. There are false prophets all through uh, the, I, I don't, you know, I hate saying the Christian church because a lot of these are not in fact in the church. Uh, they may claim, they may profess they're in the church, but they are not in fact in the church. Right. So let's say within the professing Christian world, okay, mm -hmm. there are many false prophets, and funny enough, the Word of God said that this would be the case. Jesus himself warned that false prophets, wolves in sheep's clothing, would creep in to devour the sheep and to destroy the church of the living God. We were told that the closer we came to the end time, the closer we came to the end of this age, the more and more that false prophets and false Christs would arise, paving the way for the Antichrist. Folks, I'm going to tell you, you can call this Bible bunk. You can call this Christianity a bunch of foolishness all you want to. The reality is 
the prophecies of God in the Word of God that point us toward the arrival of the Antichrist are being fulfilled in our society. They are being fulfilled in our government. They are being fulfilled in our world. Even as I speak, I never dreamed in a million years that I would live to see so divisive and evil and nasty and compassionless a degenerate as Donald Trump occupying the White House. I never dreamed in a million years I'd ever see it. I have disagreed with many individuals who have occupied the White House. I've disagreed with many individuals who occupied the Senate and who occupied the uh, Congress. But I always had this probably unrealistic belief that the majority of those who were in these offices uh, meant well, even if their policies I disagreed with, even if the way they approached things were uh, ways that I could not get in line with. But I always believed that, you know, uh, a lot of our presidents and what have you were at least at heart patriotic, decent individuals. They had good marriages, you know, they had good homes. Uh, they, they exemplified positive things for our country. There were some that I thought were less intelligent than others. There were some that I thought were less eloquent than others. But for the most part, I always held out that the leadership in our country were decent human beings. I cannot feel that way today, looking at things and seeing things and hearing what I hear. And I knew there was trouble on the horizon the moment I saw the way that this particular individual ran his campaign, I knew there was trouble. And I began to sound the warning, didn't I, Booby? I began to shout from the rooftop, people, if this man so much as is allowed to step foot into the Oval Office, we are dooming our nation to destruction. This man is wicked. He is evil. I said over and over and over and over again during the 2016 campaign for president, I said over and over again that uh, I could see as a student of history and a lover of history, I could see that Trump was literally, folks, and, and if, if you even for a second try to minimize what I'm saying right now, you're doing yourself a disservice. Yes. I literally saw in his campaign, and I said it online, I said it on Twitter, I said it on Facebook, I said it everywhere I could say it, I said it at home constantly, I said this man is walking in the footsteps of of Adolf Hitler. I said literally, literally, this man is literally doing everything exactly the way Adolf Hitler did it mm -hmm. in his rise to power in Germany. And I said, and one of the most dangerous things that could ever happen in Germany did happen, and that is that Hitler got elected chancellor. And the minute he was elected chancellor, he was given too much power. He did not have absolute power. He was not elected to be a dictator. But once he was elected chancellor, he had too much power at his disposal. And immediately, the first one of the first things he did was rewarded all the wealthy men in the country. He began to give them all kinds of breaks and give them all kinds of opportunity to make all kinds of money because he knew I need the money behind me. I need the people with money behind me because 
uh, they're going to ultimately finance my campaign. They're going to finance what I'm about to do next. He then began to systematically tear apart all the agencies within the government, not the least of which being the judiciary. Adolf Hitler began to pack the judiciary with Nazi extremists and people who held to and supported his extremist views. Why he did this as chancellor was by doing what he could in that first step, he was able to pave the way and make it clear for him then to ultimately become dictator. He knew exactly what he was doing. I've got news for you today, folks. Everything Donald Trump has done since he walked into the White House uh, has been done on purpose. None of that is by accident. Not one single bit. There is a reason why the uh, Republican Party has focused entirely on packing federal benches with extremists and ideologues. They're not packing the federal benches with a bunch of really good, solid uh, Republicans who uh, are qualified for those benches. No, they're taking people who have never even so much as argued a case in court, and they're making them uh, judges in federal seats. Are you so blind, and God forgive me, are you so stupid as not to see what's happening? Do you not understand that the Republican Party is literally trying to set our nation up for dictatorship? That is exactly what has been going on. Things are a mess right now. I'll tell you, Elijah had to go into hiding for a good while because Ahab and his harlot wife Jezebel were reigning havoc, wreaking havoc in the kingdom. And Elijah went into hiding for a period of time. And when the Spirit of the Lord finally was able to nudge him out of hiding, Elijah decided, you know what? The false prophets have been uh, encouraging the people of God to support Ahab and to support Jezebel and to support all this ungodliness that's going on in our nation. He said, but I think it's time for God to step in. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, there is a time when we need God to step in. Amen. It's not about what we can do. It's about what God can do. Amen. And this old stupid, fat old preacher is getting up today to tell you, it's time for the church to have a meeting on Carmel. It's time. The prophets of Baal outnumbered Elijah hundreds, 400 to one. Boy, I'm going to tell you, when you look for a, a man of God, a woman of God, who's going to try with all their might to do things God's way, to do things the way the Lord would have it done, I promise you, you will look through hundreds to find that one needle in the haystack. Because the false prophets are plentiful. The false prophets are prolific. They're out there everywhere, writing books, doing television shows, leading and influencing millions of people. And then you get this little prophet out in the corner of the woods somewhere whose voice can barely be heard over the traffic on the highway and he's screaming and crying out it's time for us to let God prove himself well I'm here to tell you today it's time for us to let God prove himself the message of the false prophets that would tell us that God is impotent God has done nothing concerning uh, their claims, mind you, not mine. God has done nothing concerning gay marriage. God has done nothing concerning abortion. God has done nothing on these important issues within our society. And therefore, we need to do for God what God has been 
unable to do for himself. My Lord have mercy. No, it's not an issue whether or not God has been unable to do these things for himself. The real issue is whether or not God wanted anything done to begin with. If God don't do it, I got news for you, children. It don't need to be done. That's right. Amen. Anything that God lets stand, He has let stand for a reason. You may not understand it. You may not like it. You may not even agree with it. But we're, as children of God, we're supposed to accept every moment and every circumstance and every situation as being the will of God for that moment and that time. Well, folks in the church don't want to do that. No, God hasn't done what we think God should do in these areas. So we need to influence the politic. And they're happy. They're willing to support people who engage in voter suppression. They're willing to support people who engage in voter intimidation. They're willing to support people who threaten violence. All so that they can get their desired end. And on top of all this, they claim, Tommy, that doing things this way is pleasing to God. No, honey, you're buying into the message of the prophets of Baal. You're buying into the false message. You're buying into an untruth today. Elijah finally convinced the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the groves. He finally convinced the people to meet with him on Mount Carmel. He said, we're going to have a showdown. And we're going to let God prove himself. I'm here to tell you today. I will never ever try to prove God to anybody, for anybody. I learned a long time ago. God don't need my help. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, the word of God said, My help cometh from the Lord. Hallelujah. The maker of heaven and earth. God is my help. He doesn't need my help. Right. When I'm the one who's desperate, when I'm the one who's troubled, when I'm the one who's in despair, when I'm the one whose life is in danger, I look to God. God didn't one single time ever have to look to me for nothing. That's the truth. He doesn't need my vote. He doesn't need my help. If God wants things to go a certain way, for a certain period of time, he is well capable of making things go the way he wants them to go. Am I telling the truth today? Elijah knew this. Elijah said, I'm not going to bring you all up there so we can preach sermons and you can tell us which preacher had more influence over you. I'm not going to bring you up there so we can compare followings. I guarantee you. If I called old Kenneth Copeland to account today, if I called him the false prophet that he is, if I called him the liar that he is, if I called him the demon-possessed preacher of lies and deceit that he is, and I've known this for 40 years, if I called him out, you know what he'd do? He would point to his following. And he'd say, oh, really? And who are you? Who are you to tell me what I have? Look at all the millions of people I have. And all oh, they send me their money. They believe every word I speak. Why, their evidence that I'm in the right. No, they're not. Prophets of Baal were 400. The prophets of the groves were 400. Yet 800 false prophets to one prophet of God. And the prophet of God could not claim any following. He said to the Lord, I alone seek to do your will. I alone seek to do the right thing. He said, and all these pro false prophets have convinced all of those in this nation to believe them. They had the following. They had the money. But there stood Elijah. 
You see, there's only one way for the little guy to win in the end. And I've told you before, my great mentor in ministry, one of the greatest men of God, I love him so much, and uh, he's passed on to his eternal reward. But Brother J.T. Gillum from the Riverside Church of God, I, anybody who knows me knows that I adored Brother Gillum. I appreciated his wisdom. He remains to this day uh, one of my highest, most positive and powerful influences in ministry and in Christian living. Brother Gillum told me, and I've told you this before, he said, honey, there ain't nothing in the world you can do that God can't do better. Mm -hmm. The best thing you can do when God starts moving is get out of the way and let God move. Hallelujah. If the Lord starts moving in a church service, then you don't need to preach. You need to step out of the way and let God do what He's doing. I saw services... Uh, at the Riverside Church where the power of God, the, the Holy Ghost fell in such a powerful, wonderful, glorious way that uh, waves of glory just seemed to flow over the congregation. And I mean to tell you, we shouted and we danced and we ran the aisles. I saw services in that church. Back up half a step. We live in a world today where we're told that we've got to create quote-unquote Christian music that sounds like the music you hear in the nightclubs. We need to create Christian music that sounds like the music you hear at a rock concert. We need to create Christian music that appeals to young people, that appeals to the younger generation. Because after all, we can't reach them with the old stuff. We can't reach them with the old timey stuff. Well, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Riverside Church of God never sang anything even remotely contemporary. That church didn't like it. Uh, if somebody got up and sang a special that was on the contemporary side, Tommy, you could hear the crickets. I mean, that place becomes so quiet. It didn't touch anybody in that particular congregation. There'd be two, three hundred people there, and the whole place be just dead quiet. You let an old lady get up, 85 years old, squawking like a chicken, singing like I do when my allergies are acting up, you know, and get up there and with all sincerity and with all uh, the faith in her heart sing, I bowed on my knees and cried holy, holy, holy. I clapped my hands and sang glory, glory to the Lamb of God. And I'm going to tell you something, that place to be up on its feet, people be shouting and worshiping God, and the Spirit of the Lord would sweep through that place because it didn't matter the level of talent. It didn't matter how great your voice. What mattered was if you believed what you were singing and you conveyed that conviction and that belief and that faith in your singing. And I'm telling you, uh, people get up and sing a lot of them old time southern gospel songs they love southern gospel at Riverside and I'm telling you what they had a huge number of young people in that church had a large number of young people and brother Gillum was old time Pentecostal holding his bless his heart his wife wore her hair up high and her sleeves long and her dresses long and I mean they were wonderful people they were godly people they were sincere people and they were loving people you never saw anything contentious or anything malicious come out of their mouths. I never once heard. Brother Gillum and I once talked about Tammy Faye Baker and of course Tammy Faye stood for everything that holiness people didn't stand for, you know, in terms of the makeup and the jewelry and all this and the haircuts and you know. And Brother Gillum said to me, well, you know, Chuck, said, I, I believe they're sincere people. I believe they love God, and I believe they're sincere. Here's a holiness preacher telling me about this painted-up woman, you know. He didn't agree with her. He didn't agree with the way they did things, but he had nothing negative to say about her. See, that's the kind of holiness that I like. That's the kind of people of God that I admire. Brother Gillum, I'm going to tell you, in that church of his, we saw the Spirit of God. I saw people healed. 
Oh my goodness, have mercy. I saw people healed of breast cancer during the middle of, of the uh, worship services. People were singing specials. Saw people receive the Holy Ghost. Saw a Baptist preacher's wife come into our church as the guest of one of the church members. And she was a Southern Baptist preacher's wife. And before the end of that service, she received the gift of the Holy Ghost and was speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave her the utterance. And she went home to her husband and said, I got the Holy Ghost. I received this Pentecostal experience. Her husband was mad as a horn. He said, you'll never go back to that church. I don't want you. That's just the devil. That's a lie from hell. That's demonic. And then over the next couple of weeks, he watched her. All of a sudden, one Sunday, here comes this woman again with her husband in tow. The end of the service, her husband goes down to the altar and says, I want this Holy Ghost my wife's got. Well, what's convinced you that you need the Holy Ghost? He said, I have never seen my wife love Jesus as much as I see her loving Him now. I've never seen my wife pray like she prays now. I've never seen my wife live with purpose and with such passion for the Lord as I see her living now. He said, I'm here to tell you that Holy Ghost baptism did a whole lot more for my wife than simply cause her to speak with other tongues. It has set her soul on fire. He got the Holy Ghost. He's no longer a Southern Baptist. I saw a lady one time from the Methodist church that was right across the alley from Riverside Church. She came into our church service. Long story short, she got the Holy Ghost. One night she testified, she said, several Sundays ago, she said, I was going to church over here at the Methodist Church across the alley. She said, I parked my car in the Methodist parking lot. She said, I've been a member of that church for over 40 years. She said, I got out of my car, said, all of a sudden I felt the voice of God speak to me and said, I want you to go to that church over there today. She said, okay, well, I guess I can visit it. She walked into Riverside Church of God. She said, I never felt the power of God and the presence of God in a church like I felt the presence and power of God in this church. She said, next thing you know, I'm receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. By the way, folks, the Pentecostal revivals of the early uh, 20th century actually were primarily begun in Methodist circles, in Methodist churches, amongst Methodist people. She said, I'm here now. I'm a member here now. I won't be going back to the Methodist church. You see, I've seen the fire fall. I've seen God move. I've seen God prove himself. See, I, I, I've, I've seen God do enough, Tommy, so that I never question whether or not God can do for himself what we can't do for him. Amen. Mm -hmm. I've seen God do enough so that I know he does not need my help. Amen. The Lord does not need our help. Elijah called the people to Mount Carmel. He called the false prophets to Mount Carmel. They each were to prepare an altar and they were to lay a sacrifice on the altar. And the terms that Elijah set forth were, the God that answers that sacrifice by fire, let that be God. Prophets of Baal set up their altar. They put their bullock on the altar. They put their wood on the altar. And then they begged and pleaded for hours and hours and hours. The Word of God said they began to cut themselves. I mean, they were really putting on a show. They were really going crazy trying to get their God, their, their idol, their stone God. They were trying to get their God to answer. And Elijah actually began to chide them a little. He began to tease them. He said, hey, is your God asleep? Maybe he's gotten up to go to the loo. Maybe he's gone to the potty. Something's up with your God because I don't see no fire anywhere. I don't see fire falling. When it came time for Elijah to set up his altar, the Word of God said, listen, children, he repaired 
the altar of the Lord. He did not build a new altar. But he repaired the altar that was already existent that had been broken down. I'm going to tell you something. We don't need to revamp and rebuild the church anew. What we need to do is get back to what we know. Get back to what is right. Get back to doing things God's way. Mm -hmm. Instead of following after carnal, worldly, uh, fleshly thinking. I began to say a minute ago when I got off track. That, that not that there's any... <laughs> not that that's too amazing. I saw services at Riverside. And then I'll get back to this. I saw services at Riverside, Tommy, where the Spirit of the Lord fell, and it specifically touched every single young person in that congregation. Here's a church that never sang even so much as a contemporary song. Never forget Christian rock. You'd, they'd, have, they'd have walked you right off the stage if you'd have tried that foolishness. But I saw the Spirit of the Lord fall in services and every single teenager in that congregation from the age of 19, 20 all the way down to young people five and six years old. I saw them laid out uh, on the floor, slain in the Spirit. I saw young people shouting and running the aisles. I saw young people speaking in tongues and magnifying God. I saw young women and young men dancing under the anointing and the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, all by the sovereign move of God. Wasn't a youth service. Wasn't no special music sung that service. Wasn't nothing designed to touch the young people in particular, but God had a mind to touch. I'm going to tell you something. When you do things God's way and you let God be God, God don't need your help. He don't need your worldly music. He don't need your Christian rock. He don't need your Christian rap. He don't need music that quote-unquote appeals to the young people. Honey, music is not the appeal of the church. The message is the appeal of the church. The gospel, the word of God said that the the preaching of the cross is the power of God unto salvation. It doesn't have anything to do with what kind of music you sing. If you're helping God with your style of music that you think will better reach this group or that group, God don't need your help. Just preach the cross. Just preach the message that God has given us to preach. Elijah repaired the altar. See, I'm going to tell you, the damage that false prophets like Franklin Graham, <clears throat> Kenneth Copeland, the damage that these false prophets have done to the church is mind-boggling. We don't need to build a new altar. We need to repair the altar that's already there. Amen. Then we need to present God with a sacrifice that is acceptable. Elijah cut up his sacrifice and he laid it on the altar. And then he did something really unusual. He said, dig a trench around the outside of that altar. You know, put you a little moat around the outside of that altar. And they dug a trench. The Word of God said it could hold two measures of seed. That's a lot of seed that you could have filled that trench. It didn't say they put seed in it. But they simply dug a trench that could hold two measures of seed. And then he said, now bring water. And they brought water. And they poured it over that sacrifice. And I'm going to tell you, if, if you're looking for a sacrifice to burn up with fire, the last thing in the world you want to do is pour water on it. They poured water over the bullock that had been cut up. They poured water over the wood that had been laid down. They poured water over the stone. Three different times they brought water and poured it over the entire altar and the entire wood and the entire sacrifice. Three different times. And then when they got done doing that, he said, all right, now you know what? That little trench is starting to fill up with some of the water dripping off of the rock and off of the wood and off of the bowl. He said, but do me a favor, bring more water and fill that trench up. 
Oh, I want to tell you. You can't stop the fire. You can't stop. Honey, if you think you're going to stop God from doing what God does best, you're out of your mind. I remember Brother Tatlock used to say years ago, you know, his church was an on-fire, Jesus-named Pentecostal church. I mean to tell you, oh my Lord have mercy. You went there and people were shouting and dancing and just having a wonderful time. It was an incredible environment to be in. Brother Tatlock had a marvelous old church. And he said sometimes people would ask him, well, Brother Tatlock, aren't you afraid of wildfire you know aren't you afraid of people just dancing and shouting and carrying it on and it's not inspired of the holy ghost they're just doing it on their own you know and that's what we call wildfire when somebody is in the flesh but they're doing these things you know and it happens sometimes not going to say it never happens it happens sometimes brother tatlock said oh no i'm not worried about wildfire he said there's always enough of you wet blankets around to put that out you always have people in the service who are wet blankets. You always have people in the service who if they had their way, they'd kill the spirit. They would quench the spirit. They would put out any fire, whether it be from God or otherwise. But you know what? You can't stop the fire. When God's going to move, God's going to move. When God's going to respond to the earnest desire and the earnest prayer of a sincere heart, He's going to move. He's going to act. And there ain't nothing in the world you're going to do about it. And Elijah was proving this point. I'm going to make this altar all wet. I'm going to make this sacrifice all wet. I'm going to put water, so much water on it that it will fill that trench around the outside. He said, I'm, I'm not just going to let God show what He can do. I'm going to show that God can do what nobody else on this planet could ever do. We got worship leaders in the church today. We got preachers in the church world today who think that in order for, quote unquote, the fire to fall, they've got to make sure they keep their wood dry. They've got to make sure that their sacrifice is devoid of blood and is so dry it's beef jerky. They're going to make sure that they're in the lick of water anywhere to be found near that sacrifice and near that altar. Because after all, for the fire to fall from God, he needs all the help from us he can get. We're going to use music that will better appeal to the masses. We're going to use music that will better appeal to the young people. We're going to use this that will better. We're going to use this technique and that technique. And uh, as a Pentecostal preacher who pastored through the majority of the charismatic renewal, quote-unquote, back in the 80s and 70s and what have you. And they begin to use techniques. Oh, we're going to sing songs that start out kind of slow. And then each time you sing it, you bring it up a step. And you sing it a little faster. And you sing it a little faster. And you sing it a little faster. Oh, we're going to sing fast songs that work people up into a frenzy. And get people all kind of ecstatic and all kind of emotional. And Because after all, for the fire to fall, we need to help God every way we possibly can. No, you don't. You'd be surprised what God can do with a wet altar. You'd be surprised what God can do with a wet sacrifice. You can be surprised what God can do with wet wood. Brother Gillum had retired from the Riverside Church of God, and when he retired, honestly, it was almost like his heart was just taken right out of his chest. He, he was a bloom without air. You, it, that poor man, you know, he had pastored Riverside Church. He started the church. And he pastored there for some 35 years or better. And he decided it was time, he was in his 70s, and he decided it was time to retire. And that one particular weekend, I had arranged for him to come preach for me. And that Sunday night, I knew Brother Gillum was coming, and I was so excited because he was my mentor. He was my hero of the faith. I mean, I was so excited. And he showed up, of course, you know. 
And the Holy Ghost spoke to me before the service that night. And the Lord said to me, somebody is going to be healed tonight. And somebody is going to receive the Holy Ghost tonight. So I went to that service so excited because I knew somebody was going to get the Holy Ghost and somebody was going to be healed. I didn't know who, but I knew those two things were going to happen. Well, Brother Gillum, bless his heart, he got up to preach. And he had the hardest time preaching that I've ever seen that man ever have in his entire ministry. I, I, because he was a wonderful preacher, normally. But this particular night, I mean to tell you, he struggled and struggled and just the air was out of his lungs. You know, he, he just didn't have the fire. He didn't have the passion and the drive. It, it, you could just tell that, that, you know, it was almost like his life was over. And when he got done preaching, I was sitting there and honestly in my heart, I was so disappointed and I was so... I felt so bad because I knew I'm a preacher. I know what it's like when you struggle to preach and when you really, you know. And I felt so terrible. And Sister Gillen was sitting there and you could just see a look on her face. She was just a little devastated as well. And I went up to the pulpit and I mean the church just quiet. This is my second church that I was pastoring near Fort Worth. And we had about, oh, I dare say about 40 people or so that night maybe and uh, a couple of people had come to hear Brother Gillum preach there was one young lady who I had met at the Riverside Church now they had a new pastor now and uh, one Brother Gillum because he retired so there was another young lady whose name was Crystal and she was going to Riverside now and bless her heart every time they had an altar service she'd go down to that altar seeking the Holy Ghost baptism well one day I saw her before I started this church that I my second church I saw her down at the altar praying for the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit of the Lord spoke to me if you think God ain't real honey you don't know nothing you, you you're fooling yourself if you don't believe God is real and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said she's not going to get the Holy Ghost here and I said, well, Lord, why not? He said, because she's going to get it in your church. I hadn't even started my church yet. But there were plans. I was looking, you know. He said, she's going to get it in your church. I'm thinking, well, now how many Sundays is she going to be able to go to the altar over here and not get the Holy Ghost? So eventually, somehow, some way, she can get the Holy Ghost in my church, right? And then I'm thinking, well, how in the world is she even going to come to my church? I, I'm not trying to proselyte. I'm not trying to grab people out of one church and bring them to another. Well, Brother Gillum was going to preach to me. She knew he was the former pastor of the Riverside Church, and she had never heard him preach. So she decided that night she was going to come visit my church to hear Brother Gillum preach. Well, and then Brother Gillum preached a message that, bless his heart, was just dry and, you know, kind of lifeless, I hate to say. Well, when he got done preaching, Tommy, I got up in the pulpit and I said, you know, I said, God spoke to me before this service, and I'm getting chills. I'm getting goosebumps all the way down my spine right now, just remembering this. I'll never forget as long as I live. I said, God spoke to me before this service, and he told me that somebody was going to get healed tonight, and somebody was going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When I said that, all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord fell. On our congregation people begin to stand up and they begin to pray and they begin to raise their hands and cry out to God oh Lord do what you're going to do Lord do what you're going to do little crystal came up to me and she said I've been seeking the Holy Ghost now for several months she said would you please lay hands on me and asked God to fill me with the Holy Ghost. I did, and she did. Oh, honey. She began to run around that church speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave her the utterance. She was shouting at the top of her lungs. You could hear her talking in tongues. We had a little sanctuary. It was a little uh, uh, cement block building that had been built as a church, but it was just a small building with an office and two little restrooms. 
<clears throat> and uh, she was running around this outside of that sanctuary, you know, around the outside of the pews, just speaking in tongues, shouting, glorifying God. After a while, the church phone rang, and the girl that I married's mother went and answered the phone, and she came back in the congregation. Now, we're having church. All of a sudden, the church is on fire. We're just shouting. We're worshiping this girl, dancing and shouting all over the church. We're shouting and dancing all over. We're having church. You'd have thought, Brother Gilden just preached the grace. All I said was, at the start of this service, God told me, before this service, God told me somebody was going to get healed, and somebody was going to receive the Holy That's all I said, Tommy. Now, I, I love Brother Gilman. I'm not disparaging his memory by any means, but you might have said that his preaching that night was a bunch of water on the altar. Hello now. It was a wet blanket that kind of squelched everything. Oh, but honey, when God said, when God said he's going to send fire, he's going to send fire. And you can't stop the fire. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter how much water is on the altar. It doesn't matter how much water is on the sacrifice. It doesn't matter how much water is on the wood. Oh, I want to tell you. Stacy's mom comes out and she said, Brother Charles, my mother who has cancer is in the hospital. Uh, they had to carry her by ambulance to the hospital. They said that this is the end, that there is no hope for her, that she'll be passing probably within the next 24 hours. She said, could we pray for her? Brother Love who was a very heavy set, great big man. Yes, his last name was Love. He and his wife, bless their hearts, they were both of them, roly-poly people. They sat in one of our little pews and took up the whole pew, literally. They were so big. And he was a great big fellow, sweetest man in the world. And his wife was one of the most precious ladies. And Brother Love had tears in his eyes. He said, Brother Charles, Brother Charles. See, we Pentecostals believe that the preacher ain't the only one who can hear from the Lord. And we believe in letting God have control, letting the Lord guide. Well, the Lord spoke to Brother Love's heart and told him, you need to, you need to tell Brother Charles, take a handkerchief, or, and if he don't have a handkerchief, just pull his shirt out of his pants and just cut off a piece of the tail of his shirt. Just cut a little piece off. And anoint that with oil. And you, Pastor, and that little girl, the little girl, she was in her 30s probably, or about 30, but that girl had just received the Holy Ghost. The two of you need to lay hands on that cloth. And then Stacy and Jane need to carry that to the mother in the hospital right now. And they need to just pin it to her hospital gown or something. Just pin it. And he said, that's what I feel like God's telling us. I said, all right then. Well, don't you know, couldn't find a... Couldn't find a uh, handkerchief anywhere. So I went ahead, I pulled out my shirt, and we cut a little piece off the, you know, about a two or three inch square out of the bottom of my shirt tail. Anointed it with oil. And that young lady that had just received the Holy Ghost, I put it on my palm. She reached out to grab hold of my hand, and when she did, I'm telling you, here's a girl that hadn't been in Pentecost very long, just received the Holy Ghost that night. That girl began to shout and dance. She just trying to hold on to my hand, and I'm holding, and we're praying over this cloth, and she is shouting, and she is dancing, and I'm just trying to hold her hand and hold on to this cloth. And we prayed over it, then I give it to Jesus. Jane and Jane and Stacy immediately ran to the hospital and they pinned it to her mother's her mother's thingy. Long story short, Grandma got healed. <laughs> Grandma come out of the hospital. The doctors were shocked. She lived for quite a while after that. Doctors were shocked. They didn't know what all was going on. You see, the Lord told me, I'm going to baptize somebody with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to heal somebody tonight. And God honored His Word because, honey, when God wants to do something, when people are sincere and they have a mind to do things God's way, then you can't stop 
the fire. You can't stop the fire. But you know, one of the biggest problems we have, and I'm almost closing today, one of the biggest problems we have in the church world today is too many preachers do too many things in order to pet their own egos and in order to establish their own reputations. They build these great churches, they build these big buildings and these great congregations and their motivation the entire time is, oh, I just want people to see, you know, what a wonderful job I can do. I just want people to see how great a job I can do. And they, they love the accolades and they love the praise. But you know, Elijah had the right motivation. I'm going to tell you a little secret today, folks. You may not know me, and, and you may not understand this, but I promise you, this preacher has the right motivation. Anything I do, I'm not looking for praise. I, if I was trying to you know, win accolades and win praise, I'd have quit this mess a long time ago been in affirming ministry now for 26 years and hadn't been able to uh, do a whole lot of nothing according to the way I'd like for things to be done. And I'd love to see, but I, I would love to see God touching people and healing people and filling people with the Holy Ghost and reclaiming the backslider and bringing the lost to the cross. I'd love, I'd love to be baptizing people by the dozen every week. That's what I'd love to be doing. Not so that I could have some great reputation but so that the world could see how wonderful and how powerful and how lovely Jesus is. That's what's always motivated me, and I got news for you. That's what motivates me today. Just like Elijah. Elijah wasn't trying to get God to prove he was a good guy. He was trying to get God to prove that he was God. When you pray with purpose, when you ask God to prove Himself, when you assure the Lord that He will receive the glory for that which you're asking Him to do, you can't stop the fire. It doesn't matter. Oh, I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter if you failed yesterday. It doesn't matter if you did something stupid yesterday. It doesn't matter if... Uh, you know, you sinned yesterday. It doesn't matter. You can't stop the fire. It doesn't matter. Like Elijah, Elijah had been acting in fear for a long time. All of a sudden, he finally got over his fear. I got news for you. That fear didn't affect today. Amen. His fear, his going into hiding from old uh, Ahab and uh, and. Uh, Jezebel, that fear that motivated him for a long time, movie, it didn't stop the fire. Hallelujah. When he finally decided, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to challenge this false God and I'm going to challenge these false prophets, but I'm going to do it not so that Israel can see what a great prophet I am, but so that they can see who the real God is. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. When I talk about the church not being where it ought to be today, when I talk about the church being so far from what it should be today, I'll tell you why I'm saying this. Because the world is not seeing God in the church like the world ought to be seeing God in the church. He certainly isn't seeing God in the Christians like he ought to be seeing God in the Christians. But even in the church, they're not seeing the power of God. They're not seeing the move of God. They're not seeing healing. They're not seeing deliverance. They're not seeing salvation. They're not seeing the power of God fall like it once fell. And the only way we're going to get back to that is if we repair the altar. And if we start making some sacrifices. I will tell you, God's people today, you know, everybody in the LGBT community, oh, we want a great Pentecostal church. We want a church that's LGBT affirming. Hallelujah, glory. We want one with a big choir. We want one with special singers. We want one with a big orchestra. We want one, you know, blah, blah, blah. But not a soul in the crowd is willing to make the sacrifices necessary to accomplish that. No, we'll stand back and wait. We'll keep going to Brother T.D. Jake's church. And when you get there, call me. I literally had somebody tell me that within the first couple of months of our ministry coming to Dallas. 
literally had a man tell me that. Well, when you get there, when you get this, that, and the other thing, then call me. No, you can't get there without sacrifice. Somewhere along the line, somebody got. There isn't a church on this planet that exists today that when it started, there were not people who were willing to sacrifice in order to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, children today, you can't stop the fire. If you're sincere of heart, if you want God to show himself, you don't want God to endorse you. You want God to endorse himself. You want him to reveal himself. You want him to reveal himself to your family. You want him to reveal himself to your spouse. You want him to reveal himself in a brand new way to you, yourself. Then it's time to repair the altar. It's time to offer God sacrifice. It's time today, don't worry about anything that you may think would be a hindrance. Because in the end, if you're sincere of heart, God is going to answer by fire. And you can't stop the fire. James 5.16 in closing, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Listen, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Say a righteous man, Pastor, I'm not a righteous person. I do wrong things. I, you know, I've put water on my sacrifice many times by doing this or saying that or losing my temper or doing. I got news for you, honey. Righteousness is not defined by what you do. Righteousness is defined by what you desire. God Himself spoke of David the king and psalmist of Israel. And God himself said, David is a man after mine own heart. David was as sinful a man as any ever existed. He was as imperfect a man as any man that ever walked with God. But you know what? David's heart was as pure and as sincere as anybody's heart could possibly be. You can be faulty. You can be frail. You can have failings. You can do things and say things that appear to put water on the fire. But honey, i got news for you. You can't stop the fire. You can't stop the fire. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Is your heart right with God? Do you genuinely want more than anything in this world for God to move in your children, in your family, in your life, in your spouse, in your church, in your community, in your city, in your state, in this country, in the world? Is that what you want? Because if it is, you can't stop the fire. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Mm -hmm.